NASCAR is one of the most popular motorsports in the world. 40 colorful stock cars roar by at speeds of 180 or even 200 miles an hour. One may think it's just a bunch of people getting into a car and driving in circles, but I promise you there is a lot more to it if you look at it more closely. Over the course of NASCAR's 70 plus year history, there have been many changes, evolutions, historical moments, and dark moments. What if we rewrote history? What if we were able to reimagine something and visionize something bigger? Starting in this video is a new project that explores any and all possibilities in auto racing. This is Sunday Night Lights. Thanks, Alex. In Sunday Night Lights, we'll see drivers go where they almost did or didn't at all, based on how the storyline will naturally unfold. And as we shift further off the real path, we will not only see drivers and their career statistics change, but we will see a whole shift in the sports icons, both in the case of the drivers and the cars they pilot. We may not see the number 3 Goodwrench Chevrolet, or the number 24 Rainbow Warrior, or the number 48 Low Chevrolet, or this. What? With the natural changes the new timeline brings, new driver, sponsor, and team combinations emerge, including brand new teams and sponsors that are byproducts of the new timeline's results. We could see whole new owners and ownership formats, a shift in the type of sponsors that invest, and much more. In many NASCAR what-ifs, we see people exploring the many paths drivers can take, with the championship contenders and results veering off reality. But one piece that isn't addressed is how the sport and its events appear to the people inside this whole new world. The fans your age and younger will be growing up seeing an entirely new world of NASCAR, and theoretically an entire new world in general. The domino effect is truly a wonderful thing, and the new timeline would bring with it new drivers, paint schemes, and other pieces that define a young race fan's childhood and beyond. As the domino effect continues, and the world of motorsports shifts farther from our reality, it's important to remember the role in society it takes on, both to the general public and its hardcore fanbase. We've seen a similar but smaller shift beginning in our own timeline over the 2020 season so far, with NASCAR re-emerging in the public mind as America's first team sport to return from the pandemic, as well as being a leader in promoting the fight for justice in the world of sports and entertainment. This also applies to the on-track action, thanks to NASCAR's experimentation in the last decades, most notably the playoffs and racing with stages. Could things develop in this timeline to bring a radical idea to motorsports earlier? And how will fans react if it happens? Will new viewers be attracted or not? Innovation is natural, and changes will always happen whether hit or miss, in attempts to improve the product, experience, or attract new parties. Similar to the domino effect of drivers and teams, we'll expand to new decisions made in regards to the sport itself, its tracks, its networks, its marketing, and even its traditions. It truly creates a whole new world for NASCAR and a whole new world for all of motorsports, and theoretically expands to the greater American sports landscape and beyond. Could NASCAR overtake football and baseball? Or could it fall behind and never overtake any of the major four? Will its international presence grow more than, its, than the real timeline? Could NASCAR even be open to new collaborations? The overall idea of Sunday Night Lights is to explore a new timeline based on the things that nearly happened, as well as the addition of creativity in its wide series of events. But it's important to grasp the whole new world this domino effect creates, and the additional creativity that can be explored in the outer reaches of the NASCAR world, greater motorsports world, and possibly beyond, as NASCAR could take on a whole new role in American culture, motorsports culture, and the general shifts in the world that come with it. It all starts with a single do-over, a single change, a single domino that sets off a new timeline. To start off this prologue, we will begin in the year 1981. The Daytona 500 ended up being a complete wreck fest as it took out many big names. It ended up being an upset winner in the form of 46-year-old Tommy Gale getting the win for car owner Elmo Langley, edging out the king, Richard Petty. Here are the list of winners from the 1981 Winston Cup Series season. The championship battle narrowed down to Darrell Waltrip versus Bobby Allison, but after many years, 
in a title drought, Bobby Allison was able to clinch his first NASCAR Winston Cup championship for 1981. There are a few changes coming into play for 1982, the first one being a schedule change, and our first track, What If. What if Texas World Speedway never went away? Texas World was taken off the cup schedule after 1981 and never hosted a major race event afterwards. Greg Biffle set a qualifying record there in 2012 and the track was torn down in 2016. In Sunday Night Lights, Texas World will now serve as the third to last date on the 1982 schedule and beyond. In terms of silly season changes, here is what happens here in Sunday Night Lights. Ricky Rudd will remain in the die guard number 88 after having a breakthrough season. Bobby Allison winning the championship will stay in Harry Rainier's number 28 Hardy's car. And as for the number 3 at Richard Childress Racing, Benny Parsons will move over to that ride instead of Ricky Rudd. The 1982 Daytona 500 gave us yet another huge upset. In the closing laps, the race became a fuel strategy race, and three drivers decided to stick it through in the final few laps, and it paid off. Those being Tim Richmond, Neil Bonnet, and seasoned veteran James Hilton. Driving a second car for his team, he wins the Daytona 500, and he wins his first cup race in 11 years. Terry Labonte had a dominant surge in the first half of the season, but in the second half, Darrell Waltrip went off at one point, winning four races in a row, and never looked back. Darrell Waltrip is the 1982 Winston Cup champion. And in the inaugural season of the Budweiser Late Model Sportsman Series, which would later be called the Bush Series, Sam Ard is the champion. Some silly season news going into 1983 are the following. Kelly Arbro will drive a second car for Harry Rainier in the 22 Miller Lite car. In real life, this car was owned by Die Guard, and this car will also be part-time. Ricky Rudd will remain in the Die Guard number 88, Bobby Allison is still in the 28, Benny Parsons will return to the 3 for 1983, Jody Ridley remains at Dunleavy's team for another season, Dick Brooks is in the 84 that Ridley drove in real life. Compared to the last two races of this, the 1983 Daytona 500 was not as crazy as Kelly Arborough would run up front the entire race, dominate, and he would go on to win the Daytona 500. Bill Elliott had a breakout season in 1983, scoring 4 wins, 14 top 5s, and 21 top 10s. The title race ended up getting very close between Bobby Allison and Bill Elliott. Going into the final race at Riverside, Elliott had an 8 point lead over Bobby Allison. However, Elliott's championship hopes were quickly dashed with a blown motor early in the race. And with that, Bobby Allison will win his second Winston Cup championship in 1983. Looking at the Bush Series results and standings, there seems to be a new prodigy that might be in the works. His name is Bubba Nissen. He scores the 1983 Bush Championship, winning several races. Is Bubba Nissen a future cup star? And lastly, going into 1984, Dale Earnhardt moves to Richard Childress' team just like in real life. Cliff Stewart buys into Die Guard's team to become Die Guard Stewart Racing. Ricky Rudd is back in the 88 Gatorade Pontiac. The team adds a second car for rookie Rusty Wallace in the 89 Burger King Pontiac. Mark Martin had a win early in the 1983 season and stayed on a consistent note in Jim Stacy's number two car. Instead of going to ASA, Martin moves to Bud Moore's number 15 Wrangler Ford and looks to prove himself that he belongs in the Winston Cup Series. Bobby Allison is still in Rainier's number 28. Kelly Yarbrough is still in that second Rainier car. Dick Brooks and Jody Ridley swap rides, with Brooks moving to Dunleavy's number 90. To start off the 1984 season, the Daytona 500 is one to remember. Things began to get interesting midway through as a pop-up shower hit the backstretch out of nowhere, causing several cars to spin, taking out many big contenders. But not only that, watch Mike Alexander absolutely make his way through like as if you were watching a movie an incredible move by mike alexander got through everything at full speed 
just fine. The race came down to an intense battle between Dale Earnhardt and Ricky Rudd, and with two laps to go, Mark Martin tangled with a couple front runners, which meant a race back to the line for the win. Earnhardt and Rudd were side by side coming to the line, and in a photo finish, Dale Earnhardt edged out Ricky Rudd to win the 1984 Daytona 500, 14 years before doing so in real life. In his first race with car owner Richard Childress, this Daytona 500 will be one to remember for a long time. The championship once again came down to an intense battle between Terry Labonte, Harry Gant, and Dale Earnhardt. The points lead switched back and forth in the final races between Labonte and Gant, and going into the final race of Riverside, Harry Gant had a three-point lead over Terry Labonte. However, that decimated quickly as Terry Labonte dominated the entire race and won at Riverside, also meaning that Terry Labonte is the 1984 Winston Cup champion. Meanwhile, in the Bush series, Bubba Nissen goes on to prove that he may be ready to move up to the Winston Cup circuit, winning back-to-back -back Bush Grand National Championships, winning it for 1984. Also starting in 1984, we start to introduce the International Race of Champions, known as the IROC Series, another series that we will cover in Sunday Night Lights. There is another track what if coming in for 1985, and this one is rather timely with what's going on in our timeline right now. What if the Cup Series remained at the Nashville Fairgrounds? Nashville will retain one race on the schedule coming in after the Firecracker 400 at Daytona. There weren't a whole lot of changes in terms of silly season, but the biggest one was Bubba Nissen. As I just mentioned, he moves up to the NASCAR Cup circuit, driving the number 59 goodies car for his own team. It's going to be interesting to see how he'll be able to develop among with the top stars of the Winston Cup circuit. Also, Buddy Baker ends up going to Baker Chef Racing just like in real life, but instead of driving the 89, he now drives the number 86. For the 1985 Daytona 500, last year it was Dale Earnhardt. This time around, another popular driver was able to get his first Daytona 500 win, and that happened to be the 1982 champion, Daryl Waltrip, driving for Junior Johnson. He wins the 1985 Daytona 500. The 1985 season brought a lot of excitement in the Cup Series, including some first-time winners. J.D. McDuffie scored an upset win at Michigan, Ron Bouchard won at the Firecracker 400, and Sam Ard winning at Nashville in a rare Cup start. Sam Ard never had his career ending crash in 1984 in Sunday Night Lights, and with that, he does make on and off Cup Series starts, and he just happened to get his first Cup win at Nashville. This will make him eligible for the All-Star Race in 1986. Speaking of the All-Star Race, this will be the first year of the NASCAR All-Star Race, which is held at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Tim Richmond ended up beating out Bill Elliott to win the inaugural running of the race. In the end though, it was a dominating season for Bill Elliott and he got his revenge from coming up short in 1983. Bill Elliott, Awesome Bill from Dawsonville is the 1985 NASCAR Winston Cup Series Champion. As Bubba Nissen left for the Cup Series, Danny Marshall, someone that we're going to be talking about a lot in Sunday Night Lights, was finally able to score the Bush Series Championship for 1985. Speaking of Danny Marshall, he has been attempting on and off Cup races this entire time. He has been running more Cup races as of late while focused on the Bush Series Championship. For 1985 and 1986, He's driving the number 85 for his own team with his family sponsorship, Marshall Motors, backing him. And maybe, just maybe by 1987, he could be running Cup full time. And one notable thing for Silly Season 1986, we will be digging through all sorts of different rumors and what ifs from over time. Such as, for example, there were apparently talks that Davey Allison was going to drive the 95 for the Sadler Brothers for a one year deal, but it fell through. But in this timeline, Davey Allison will be piloting that number 95 for the Sattler brothers, being rookies, with another certain driver that we'll be talking about later on, being Alan Kowicki. It'll be interesting to see how Davey Allison does this season, as he could potentially go to Rainier Racing in 1987.
The final year of the Sunday Night Lights prologue will cover 1986. Starting things off with the Daytona 500, we had a finish similar to the one just two years prior. Jeff Bodine ended up making a power move on the outside just enough to get by Terry Labonte and he will win the 1986 Daytona 500 for Rick Hendrick. While it looked like it was about to be a back-to-back -back kind of thing for Bill Elliott, Dale Earnhardt caught fire late in the season, winning the last four of five races in 1986 and for the first time since 1980, Dale Earnhardt is once again a Winston Cup Series champion. This is his second championship in the Cup Series. The Bush Series pretty much shaped up to be Sam Ard versus Danny Marshall once again, and Danny Marshall being the second driver in the short history of the Bush Series to win back-to-back -back champions. He's the 1986 Bush Series champion. And that will cover it for the prologue of Sunday Night Lights. As you can tell, this will be a grind, and there's a long journey ahead. Who knows exactly what will happen? Who knows what NASCAR will look like by 2000 in this timeline? There is so much to cover, and so much more that we have planned for you guys. We will begin work on 1987 shortly. We don't have a deadline exactly when it will be ready, but we will let you guys know. Here's my Twitter in case you want any updates on Sunday Night Lights. Thank you guys so much for watching this. I got to work on this a lot during the quarantine especially, and this is something that me and my friends have been wanting to do for quite some time. So we will be releasing more details about how each season will go here soon. We'll let you know. Thank you guys so much for watching this prologue, and this is only the beginning. I'm SonicRules831, and I will see you guys in the next video.